Good afternoon, students and faculty members. I see quite fam some familiar names here. So it gives me immense pleasure to be able to talk to you again. I thank the organizers for having invited me. I remember last year I spoke uh, in this very premises. And uh, those days we thought that uh, we would be done with all this online webinars and we thought we would get back to a world where we see real people with uh, real smiles and real faces but unfortunately after a year the situation is much the same i hope you have been uh, engaging yourself uh, with a lot of theories in the past two days and i hope they are giving you new perspectives to think and engage with so today uh, i'm here to talk on ecology and gender if you see the history of uh, ecological consciousness in literature and social sciences, it has a very long history. When one discusses ecology and gender, the first thought that comes to the mind is ecofeminism. And when one hears the word gender, only women's issues color the mind. So I think this was the, uh, this was the case uh, in the 90s when uh, there were many gender studies departments which were established and introduced in colleges and universities, but most of them uh, studied texts by women writers. And around the same time, what happened was women's studies departments also came into the academic uh, limelight, where uh, you know there were many departments, mostly English departments, and uh, probably some political science departments started the gender st women's studies department, and. Uh, those days it was necessary that women's studies uh, were uh, studied and because uh, the canon, the literary canon was uh, devoid of any women writers and slowly it came about, but uh, it remained as uh, tokenism in many places. Even today our syllabus, if you look at them, you know, we have women writers, but not as many as we would like to see. Now, ecofeminism, if you see, uh, it was widely recognized and practiced by many scholars and activists, and it still remains a popular area for many research scholars. I think if you look at the conference it, uh, of ecocriticism, which is uh, convened, and if you look, take a look at the abstracts, you will see that there are many papers on ecofeminism and how women and nature are you know, subjugated under the patriarchy. And even now, if you see, this is a very popular area, not only in India, outside of uh, Indian academia as, as well. In fact, long before eco-criticism, eco-feminism, which gained in the 1970s, holds much relevance today. But the positions have uh, changed. Whether these approaches are called gender and environment, environmental feminism, eco-feminism, fem feminist environmental justice, or another term, they demonstrate the immense value of feminist thinking about the relationship of social inequalities to environmental problems. Now you might wonder why should ecological issues be tied to gender? Now attention to gender is an important aspect of understanding environmental issues because I quote, of the long association between the concepts of gender and nature, the gendered interaction of human labor with the environment and the gendered impacts of environmental degradation, leaving gender out of attempts to conceptualize, examine, and correct environmental problems means that our understanding is deeply inadequate and our solutions quite partial. Close quotes. Today, the coming of these two critical theories of uh, feminism and environmentalism which was formerly known as ecofeminism, is even more relevant today because both these theories have deepened and have become quite inclusive because they have opened up to, I mean, feminist theory was just a beginning. And from there, it kind of became inclusive to uh, concepts of decoloniality, post-coloniality, trans theory, queer theory, women of color feminism, and uh, critical disability studies. But uh, ecofeminist theory has also given attention to other non-human species such as the animals, the land, the plants, the fungi, water, and in general, 
the exploitation of the non-human as part of its growing critical set of tools. As environmental feminism is now more uh, inclusive, it is closer to achieving answers that take into account all systems of oppression. And oppression could be found in various quarters of human as well as non-human life. Now, similarly, feminist theory is also appearing in every discipline as a critical analysis in the humanities. The social sciences have opened to it, the natural sciences have opened to it, and all interdisciplinary points. So in a sense, feminism finds its feminism finds its space in uh, many interdisciplinary areas, and uh, a lot of uh, topics are connected to uh, gender. But also, it must be remembered that uh, ecofeminism, which started off, uh, you know, with the popular claim that women are more closer to nature than men. I think ecofeminism should move beyond that premise, and that is slowly happening in various places. In fact, practitioners of ecology and gender should question the very idea of women and nature, and they should attempt understanding the diverse ways in which gender shapes and is shaped by human relations as well as uh, human relations with other species and the environments. But uh, it's, um, I don't know whether it is good or bad, the simplistic narrative about women saving the planet persists very much in the Indian academia. Because in the Indian academia, uh, a lot of text, especially I think in the, in the, in the conference rooms, uh, Mahashweta Devi, uh, Margaret Atwood, are very, very popular. And every conference has uh, papers which talk about them. And uh, there seems to be a certain, uh, uh, probably I would say a certain stagnation where we are uh, not moving beyond uh, equating uh, women to the environment. And, uh, and this, uh, and, but if you see these two terms, ecology and gender, they are quite contested and since they are contested it is uh, it is good to observe and see how they come together so ecology is even more contested because we are using it in the social sciences humanities uh, background so now if you see the term gender it broadly refers to the collection of characteristics which is used for categorizing people with reference to dominant understandings of masculinity and femininity it is uh, typically thought to be the sociocultural layer which sits on top of the biological sex, such that those of the male sex tend to be culturally masculine. But even inanimate things without hormones and organs can be gendered. I think some languages have uh, a specific gender uh, gendering of their nouns. I think Hindi is one such language and, uh, you know, uh, I'm not, I, I don't think English is, but uh, certain other uh, Indian languages where, you know, you use the gendering for uh, certain nouns. So that is uh, what it means by even uh, in, uh, even non-human uh, things are, you know, gendered and, uh, you know, they are given uh, characteristics that either belong to the masculine or the feminine. So gender is actually used more commonly as a means to impose expectations and roles upon groups and is claimed and performed as part of an individual's identity. And gender becomes a thing. It's not just a simple classification, but it's also, it also becomes a tool of uh, social control. It serves to position people according to the dominant ideology. And the gender and uh, e gender and ecology scholars have found that the analysis of the binary structure is important for understanding the links between gender and environment. The analysis naturalizes. And the feminization of nature and the cultural evaluation of both women and nature are at the core of this.
as human environment relationships. But then Greta Gard, an eco-feminist scholar and activist, she opines that women-centric and single-access approach of gender and environment research uh, has been a double-edged sword for the field. Because on one hand, those who are focused on women as a category uh, are, are criticized for universal, universal, universalizing and essentializing, uh, for leaving out men, trans people, and gender queer people out of the story. Now, queer scholars have noted that focusing only on women can result in the mistake of treating the experience of some usually privileged, uh, especially when it comes to terms like these, I talk about the in heterosexual cisgender women. When I say cisgender, I hope you understand the term. Cisgender uh, means people who identify with the biological uh, biological uh, organs they were born with. And, uh, and uh, now, this uh, when, when we use the term gender, what we do is, in fact, we mask that women, men, queer, and trans people are not situated equally in terms of environmental op oppression. What happens is the sometimes gender can just be used, and when we say gender, we actually only mean certain groups of people, which is uh, not inclusive of the many others who are in the spectrum of gender. And Indian academia especially has uh, is uh, not woken to the fact that queer and trans people are also part of the gender spectrum. Of course, this is uh, slowly changing, which is very good. And I see some scholars in some pockets uh, of the Indian academia who are trying to study homosexuality and nature and queer nature, but they are still a significantly smaller number. Now, since eco since e eco feminism is a fairly well known and preferred area of investigation, and I assume that many of you uh, are familiar with that, I would like to focus on lesser practiced areas of gender and ecology. And uh, these areas are eco and on now, if you see the word eco-masculinities, it, it is a portmanteau of two words. It's it's from the uh, eco eco is from the ecology, which is the Greek word, which means oikos, and uh, oikos also means household in the Greek, and so it's a dwelling place. And uh, masculinities is uh, an upcoming theoretical discourse which has been gaining currency in the last three decades. And uh, while many scholars were writing and engaging in the field of masculinity studies since the 90s, analysis of masculinities and environment uh, were prevalent in the works by uh, two scholars, Carolyn Merchant and R. W. Connell in the 80s. But uh, they were not very popular in the, in the environmental humanities. Now, gender roles and social order, you know, automatically slant towards women and see women as being peaceable, caring, and environmentally friendly. While men are men and the patriarchal system is viewed as, you know, they are seen as perpetrators of violence, dominance, aggressiveness, and threats. And uh, even though we say that gender roles are socially constructed and, uh, you know, but we forget to see that uh, it, it, we kind of tend to generally make a sweeping general statement about men and women. And uh, we cannot deny the fact that uh, the policymakers, the people who are taking important decisions with regard to climate change are mostly men and men of privilege. And, uh, that's why uh, eco masculinity tries to somehow arrive at a point where it tries to also give a slightly different perspective to the entire area of uh, masculinity. And uh, if you see the definition of masculinity is not very homogeneous. But uh, uh, Kimmel and Bridges, they point this out in the introduction to the volume called Masculinity, which was published in 2014. I quote, 
Masculinity varies historically. What is thought of masculine changes over time. Second, masculinity varies cross-culturally. Conceptualizations of masculinity are culturally specific. Third, masculinity varies intra-physically. What it means to be a man changes over the course of one's life. Finally, masculinity varies cross-culturally. Conceptualizations of masculinity are uh, culture-specific. Third, masculinity varies intra-physically. What it means to be a man changes over the course of one's life. And if you see masculinity, it varies actually. Even within a given society and time period, masculinity can mean different things to different people. Now, one important contribution worth mentioning, and uh, these are the scholars who are Presently, in present time, working very actively in the area of ecological masculinities are uh, Martin Haltman and Paul Fuller. And the very recent volume, uh, 2018 volume, Ecological Masculinities, Theoretical Foundations and Practical Guidance is a, is a volume that discusses the area of ecological masculinities. So in this volume, there is a detailed study which combines all the four diverse streams of theories which come into being when ecology and uh, gender are discussed. One is masculinities, masculinities politics, a deep ecology, ecological feminism, and feminist care theory. So they combine these uh, four different and diverse theories and they examine the human and uh, planetary costs of uh, ecology, ecologically destructive masculinities, and they outline an important new lens to understand and address the social environmental challenges that are across the planet Earth. So if you see this volume, it provides a very deep analysis into the connection of men, masculinities, and earth care. Now the second upcoming area of critical inquiry is trans ecology and uh, Ecology is something which is very close to me because my uh, research, my PhD research uh, was with a group of transgenders who were situated in Madurai and I was trying to look at uh, what uh, is their connection to, <clears throat> what is their connection to nature and how we can situate uh, the transgenders in, uh, in the theory of eco-criticism. I must confess it was not a very easy uh, it was not very easy for me because uh, the days when I was doing my uh, uh, research, access to materials was not very easy. But today I see there are a lot of materials, especially by a scholar and the various other uh, platforms. You can actually uh, get access to a lot of materials and research papers, which was not available those days. I often think that if I was doing my research today, probably it would have been a much uh, richer work. But but then, yeah, we can always uh, do our research. And uh, I think all of you who are studying in the present generation, I think you are in fact very lucky because you have access to some good material. And even if you don't have access to material yourself, you can always ask uh, to some scholar who is in that area some, elsewhere in the country or outside the country so that you could access uh, research papers and read many um, topics which uh, you know interest you so uh, this area is still very nascent uh, and uh, it connects the issues of trans people to that of ecology and the environment now some of the theorists and ideas uh, that could be examined in this field include uh, stacy alimo stacy alimo talks about uh, trans corporeality the, the trans in her uh, trans corporeality does not refer to the trans people, but rather refers to the moving of you know how the fluidity of the uh, fluidity of the humans and the non-humans, uh, and she talks about that zone as a contact zone be between humans and connectedness of all beings. And Susan Stryker, Susan Stryker is. Uh, is a very popular and uh, 
and a well-known writer in this uh, in the area of transgender studies. She has an exclusive reader titled Transgender Studies, where she discusses various aspects of uh, transgender lives, which include their transitioning and uh, their medical issues, their legal issues, their political issues, and histories. And uh, if somebody is interested in the area of transgender studies, I think her books are something which you should look out for. And uh, Susan Stryker's notion of trans identity is something which she calls as ontologically inescapable. Now, Katriona Mortima Sandilands and Brooke Erickson's history of the development of queer rural spaces, Judith Butler's analysis of gender as performative, and uh, all these uh, are many aspects which lend to the uh, theoretical area of uh, trans ecology. They add to whatever is there. And uh, there are, I mean, among these theoreticians themselves, there are, uh, there are a lot of uh, different, uh, you know, different ideas which sometimes do not exactly uh, go well with each other. Now, uh, some, I mean, I mean, I'm talking about some experiences which I have read based on students, uh, students' uh, interactions with particular texts, especially when it comes to Judith, Judith Butler's analysis. Uh, there were some uh, trans, uh, trans students who felt that uh, Judith Butler's uh, analysis of gender is performative, cannot be right, because they feel that they are not performing, they're quite real. And uh, I mean, one has to, I think, get the difference between performative and performance when it comes to understanding uh, gender. And uh, maybe Many of my observations in this uh, particular section, which I'm going to discuss, that is trans ecology, is from the recent uh, volume titled Trans Ecology uh, Transgender Perspectives on Environment and Nature, which was published by Ratlitch in 2020. And this book, I think, is the first book which uh, brings all the issues of uh, the trans ecology. I mean, there have been books on gender and, uh, you know, eco feminism. And, and even when you discuss eco feminism and when you talk about uh, masculinities there is you know there are stray references to trans people but i think this uh, volume is something uh, where many scholars i think about uh, 30 odd scholars have come together to uh, write about various aspects of uh, trans ecology and how uh, the disciplines of transgenders uh, transgender studies and ecological studies come together some have analyzed uh, literary uh, literary uh, texts and somehow some have analyzed environment issues some have looked at films some have looked at uh, the problems that uh, they have undergone and all these things and they all are speaking from a perspective of how this of how these two disciplines could come together now uh, I would like to quote Susan Stryker here. She has written the foreword to this volume. She she writes how the trans people do not uh, figure in the binary hierarchy. Now, uh, when we talk about women's issues, we talk about how uh, you know in this binary the women is all the woman is always uh, you know subordinated and one one part of the binary is always strong and that is always the man. But Susan Stryker goes. A step forward and says that uh, trans uh, trans people are uh, invisible and non-existent when it comes in the binary because they do not belong to the binary itself she says i quote i critique notions of nature that were but bedeviling lies fictions that cloaked beneath the pretense of inevitability the machinations of social powers so detrimental to my life and to the lives of those like me the enemy of my nature is a nature that is home to man, but not to me. I asserted then my sense of life as being filled with monstrous potential of which I acknowledged my egalitarian relationship with non-human material being. Now, while women, though marginalized and, consider and are considered inferior, the trans are even denied their existence because they are often considered as unnatural and fake because they choose to deny the parameters of what is considered natural. And this natural uh, is always defined by the dominant systems which are functional in the society. 
and uh, this natural means the birth that they are assigned to when they are born and uh, this particular uh, idea of natural itself is problematic because there are many non human organisms that show that show queer tendencies and uh, when it comes to organisms such as that i don't think anybody would call them as unnatural but when it comes to uh, humans and when i say humans i think uh, most of the dominant narratives read it as man man okay humans are human is equivalent to man and when when girls like human civilization are used it's actually man's civilization yeah i think these are all common things which most of you are aware now scholars who are actively participate in this field they argue that the word trans is just it, it's it's beyond than a liminal space in the gender circuit now uh, scholars eva hevert and jemmy weinstein they explain that trans is not a thing or being it is rather the processes through which the thingness and beingness are constituted in its prefixial state when you use the word trans in, in you know as a prefix to any word it the word trans is prepositionally oriented marking the width through of in and across that make life possible so trans actually troubles ontologized states and uh, greta gard again writes eco criticism has from the beginning invoked a transdisciplinary methodology she says how eco criticism was uh, uh, not limited to certain texts and certain uh, areas it was it, it was reading across literary narrative and cultural genres to create the grounds among and with through multiple standpoints and is thus well well positioned for developing more only transgender critics so she says the eco criticism uh, has you know it's well positioned to actually talk about uh, transgender critics and she tries to say how this discipline lends itself to uh, being more open to the inclusion of uh, talking about diverse sexualities and it should also be remembered that uh, trans transgender studies when you look at uh, not transgender sorry trans ecological studies and you read uh, the reader it, it it kind of doesn't generally uh, define itself or it doesn't uh, uh, you know it doesn't limit itself to transgenders but it just looks at the word trans and the word trans is uh, as i Uh, read out from a quote it 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 seems like it's a process it's not something which is which has a final destination but it is always in a state of uh, it's in a porous state which is fluid even gender is seen as something like that and that is exactly the trans which stacy alimo is also talking about when she talks about trans corporeal when she talks that you know you cannot exactly demarcate where the human and the non human uh, stop and where they connect and you cannot just define i mean it's kind of enmeshed temothy moch another uh, scholar talks about how it's enmeshed enmeshed in the sense you cannot separate them and uh, uh, donna haraway is another very influential scholar who talks about she talks about nature cultures she does not segregate the word she talks about them as one single word nature cultures and she tries to say that uh, you know you cannot actually separate them you cannot say this is nature and that is culture or that is culture this is nature it's a kind of continuum they are enmeshed within each other they transcorporeal which means that you cannot exactly uh, you know uh, put them in a boundary and i think trans ecological studies is just that it talks about uh, it 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 doesn't it tries to delve into various aspects of how everything is in a state of flux so uh, in this uh, it is worthwhile at this point to consider the questions which are raised by mortimer sandilands and erickson in in their uh, in their volume uh, queer ecologies uh, so they are raising questions as to how to understand this entire phenomenon in what ways to understandings of nature inform discourses of sexuality and in what ways to understandings of sex inform discourse nature and they say moreover 
what does it mean that ideas spaces and practices which are designated as nature are often so vigorously defended against queers in a society that in which that very nature is increasingly degraded degraded and exploited so they try to question uh, uh when 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 nature itself is being exploited to see trans people or or, or to see people of various other uh, non dominant sexualities occupying that space in nature is being questioned by uh, Mortimer, Mortimer Sandilands and Erickson what do queer interrogation science politics and desire then offer uh, to environmental understanding and how might a clearer attention to issues of nature and environment as discourse as space as ideal as practice as relationship as potential inform and enrich queer theory lgbtq politics and research into sexuality and society uh, it is no doubt that uh, queer ecology has uh, not been able to permeate the indian academia as much as feminism has Uh, I, there are people who work on queer studies. There are people who work on uh, transgender narratives. But I think uh, the the coming together of uh, gender studies as well as ecology or environmental studies is uh, not very pronounced in the Indian academia. I i tried to locate materials but i was able to find many rise to a lot of uh, interesting uh, thesis is on uh, this topic now while india but but it should not be denied that uh, india does have a rich history of transgender uh, individuals in its literature and mainstream media if you see there are many autobiographies of uh, transgender people which has come i mean that some of them are very popular for example uh, lakshmi lakshmi tripathi and rose and kalki and all these people are uh, quite popular in the indian uh, scenario and there have been transgenders who have joined the police forces who have become principals of uh, colleges and who have uh, you know done a lot of things and if you see uh, if you just run a google uh, search for them you will find a lot of a lot of uh, uh, transgender individuals are very popular but studies on them are yet to become uh, you know something which is uh, sought after what happens is many of them don't uh, you know it's just it's just okay it's it's just dismissed like okay it's that's very nice they are being included that's it but the academia i think the canons have to be you know either uh, changed or the canons have to be more welcoming of uh, diverse literatures into their syllabus now uh, but uh, uh, but but how do we but but i was also very interested in how a uh, human uh, how the ecology and trans can be connected and investigated in the indian context because that was something i worked with now while human nature relationship is discussed and analyzed it is usually as i told you earlier human is always take reference to the heteronormative man and in some uh cases the heteronormative uh, woman now if you see section 377 though it has been repealed and uh, you know the court just the court did state that when it comes to consensual hum- homosexual sex between adults the law was unconstitutional irrational indefensible and manifestly arbitrary but the fact that this law which was introduced in 1861 by the british is still functioning uh, is quite questionable now i remember the time before uh, to 2018 before this law was uh, repealed and uh, it was quite a hard time for the people in the lgbtqia community they felt extremely threatened they felt excluded and highly marginalized from the mainstream heteronormative law uh, which ostracized them but in spite of this uh, repealing the transphobia is quite active in the mainstream society and if you see there are market differences uh, in the way the transgenders 
are treated in North India and treated in South India. I just wanted to read uh, an autobiography by uh, a transgender who uh, who is called Living Smile Vidya. So she says how she tried to escape the uh, the very uh, you know the very suppressive environment at home. Uh, she she hails from a South Indian town, and so she wanted to escape that, and she migrates to uh, Pune. She goes to Pune, which is in the west of India, and uh, she feels that the west of India, I mean, uh, the North India and the other parts of India are more welcoming of transgenders because they try to look at them as gods, and they try to, uh, you know, try to seek their blessings when something good happens to them. Now, this could be uh, wholly studied in the point of view of uh, how nature and how the uh, how the natural uh, natural world is treated. I mean, uh, if you see it, religion, religion itself by religion by itself has a lot of rituals which has uh, which worships uh, which worships uh, nature and uh, it tries to you know uh, look upon to nature for various things, but. But the same uh, nature, when it comes to saving uh, forests and uh, you know uh, taking care of uh, ecosystems, fails miserably. Our, uh, I mean, our, the religion of our land is such that I mean the dominant, the so-called dominant uh, narrative of religion that runs through our land talks about how everything is uh, you know the trees are sacred and you have specific trees for specific uh, days worshipping them but when the, when the same thing is not shown when it is uh, you know writing its policies i mean the environmental policies which are which have recently been out are not very favoring and uh, and the and the incidents which are happening around in our country is not a very uh, very glowing state of affairs for a country which claims that uh, which worships nature and similarly this could be equated to the way uh, the uh, the trans people are treated as well in um, in general. I'm not talking about any specific place here. And how uh, while while they are also seen as uh, as uh, uh, you know they worship when when a new child is born in the north of India, the transgenders are called to the houses to bless these babies. But what happens is uh, their roles are just really are uh, just relegated to that. When they, apart from that, there seems to be no a progression when it comes to inclusivity. So now you see how how you can see how you can connect these two aspects of nature and the trans people. And uh, uh, so even if you see the idea of uh, purity, and all these things are essential mechanisms which are controlling women. I mean, when you have a, you know, when you have a you know, you, you have a woman uh, in, in, in mythology and you try to emulate it, for example, your all the women who are there in these epics and women and nature are put upon pedestals. I just mentioned that. But uh, when, when individuals do not fall into this, uh, you know, into this binary constructions of masculinity and femininity or male and female, uh, they are not considered, I mean, they are, uh, it's 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 a very ambivalent state that they face. While on one hand they are worship they are worshipped for certain things, but on the other they are not even considered, uh, you know, they're not considered as important as the male or the female. Now, while the trans people they undergo the sex change operation to become, and the word become I have uh, I I'm saying it within codes. Uh, they try to become a woman, the failure to arrive at a true gender uh, returns us to the impossibility of purity or the dichotomy of gender. Now, what happens is uh, when, when, when a man feels that he is, not, uh, he is not the one who he is biologically being born as and they feel the need to transition into a woman, uh, they, they undergo all the different aspects to... Yes, uh, is there a question? Uh, Dr. Aisha? Uh, no, ma'am, it's just a request for the feedback. 
no ma'am no uh, okay sorry i just uh, saw the hand up and i thought okay there should be there is a, uh, something that i should answer thank you okay so where was i yeah i was trying to say that even though they try to become a woman after the operation and the operation is a very crude process in india it's not a proper surgical operation as it happens in the west and other places it is a very crude operation where uh, where uh, their uh, the male organ is just cut off and uh, uh, it's allowed to heal that that's it that, there is nothing like a reconstruction of uh, the the organ uh, the vagina or something like that so what happens is uh, the uh, even though just uh, the castration does not make a man a woman while they like to consider they they consider themselves as women and they behave so and they uh, think of themselves like that but the the predominant uh, world which is made of these binaries of male and female refuse to accommodate them and i think this kind of an ambivalence is seen in the treatment of nature as well and uh, very often you can see that you know uh, they are often uh, seen as sterile devoid of reproductive capabilities which are attributed to women so it is almost as if you, if, if you are not able to reproduce you are not a woman even though you have had your sex uh, reassignment surgery and uh, and these things uh, make them uh, you know uh, and they're not uh, seen as men and they're not seen as women but you should understand all these labels are uh, given by the dominant uh, narratives the, the dominant heterosexual cisgender people but as they when it when it comes to the transgender themselves they think of themselves as women and that what that is what is important because uh, your gender is something which you are comfortable with and you believe it is the fact and uh, what happens uh, what the others think of it is not the prerogative but it doesn't happen that way and uh, the fact that these individuals refuse to identify with the gender which are assigned to them by birth and they choose to change it renders them unnatural because they have it, it uh, the because they have chosen to deny their naturalness and naturalness is often associated associated with accepting the the biological sex you have been born into so uh, you know and if you see uh, when you come to the literary aspect of it in many uh, connecting uh, ecology and gender how to go about analyzing them if you see uh, transgender autobiographies one common feature that is present in all of these is uh, travel travel from i mean they uh, constantly you can see that they are moving about they leave their homes because they are not welcome because uh, because in many homes at least in the rural areas what happens is uh, uh, some of them are born after great uh, you know after a long penance to the god and they and for want of a male heir and they are born uh, after a great deal of prayers and everything and so when uh, when they decide that they want to change their uh, gender and uh, they start behaving and uh, putting on the clothes and behaving like women the parents and the extended family members are not very comfortable with that so they have to ultimately leave homes though this does not happen to all of them to at least uh, most of them it happens so they have to leave their home and then they come to uh, another place they come to a community of uh, similar people transgendered individuals living together they have their own family system which is very which uh, which which uh, is like the matriarchal uh, family system and there is a system of adoption uh, where one transgender adopts the other and the and that uh, transgender adopts another transgender and so the cycle keeps going uh, to just have a, a sense of security and a semblance of a family life and everyone has their own duties they have everything assigned to them but even then even in those places what happens is sometimes they have a lot of uh, problems and so they leave that place also now this uh, the, the place the the play the ecology of place and the the need for travel in the transgender's life is something it's it's a it's a trope which can be used to study their lives and equate that to uh, how uh, 
you know, as they're trying to make peace, as they're trying to make uh, their body their home, they're also trying to find a place for themselves, which is the physical home. Now, uh, this, this search keeps going on for a very long time in many of these uh, transgenders' lives. And uh, if you see the body itself, and you, if you try to understand, they are trying to make peace with their bodies, because their bodies are uh, the site for... Uh, Susan, ma'am. Hello. Uh, participants, please wait. Uh, I think our resource person is experiencing a technical glitch. She'll be back shortly. Yes, ma'am. You're back. I'm, yeah, I just realized that. I'm sorry. I just got uh, disconnected. Uh, I'm having some connectivity issues here. Ma'am, it's okay, ma'am. Uh, that's a trauma of being in an online world. We depend on technology so much that. Yeah. Now, technology is okay, ma'am. Please continue. Out. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I was talking to, uh, talking to you about how uh, looking at the transgender narratives of place connect and connect them to ecology can good, can be a good uh, can good be can be a good way of looking into their uh, <clears throat> narratives. But uh, it should also be remembered that uh, there is a great deal of difference between uh, the rural and the urban uh, point of conflict in the trans community. Because many times what happens, many of the trans people try to migrate from rural areas to the urban areas. But these urban areas, even though they migrate from the, uh, from the problem of their homes, what happens is even in the urban places, they are at the fringes of the society. I mean, often living in places which are not uh, places where uh, people, uh, the mainstream, the, the privileged people live. Uh, often they live in slums and uh, they live in... Uh, in places where there are a lot of squatters, uh, you know, using the place, 
which is uh, almost like uh, almost like uh, being towards the margins which is not a very uh, which is not a very pleasant place to live and and even uh, it, it, and even nature if you see when i say nature i talk about the environment around when it comes to uh, when it comes to the saving of trees when it comes to taking care of the biodiversity and the ecosystems uh, while many of them discuss that and people are very prompt in planting trees everywhere uh, to take care of uh, uh, these entire systems by means of sound policies and uh, strong environmental laws is not happening and similarly uh, social uh, so human right workers human rights workers and everybody who is uh, who paying for the lives of the transgenders are uh, aware that even though a lot of things are being done to preserve and take care of the welfare of the trans people it is not something which is substantive which is not included in the policy say for some states now now continuing the same argument of the natural and the unnatural uh, another uh, scholar which uh, who is worth mentioning and who is very active in this area is nicole seymo <laughs> and uh, she points to nature itself as a site of transition uh, because many times what happens is nature is often seen as something which is exclusively there and you know it is it is in its pristine form and it's it is it's, it's, it's in a form that cannot be disturbed or it's, it has always been like that so uh, she points out the fact that nature is always transitioning now uh, another scholar catherine hales in 1999 famously claim that all of us are post human yeah and donna haraway who i mentioned some time earlier she has said that we are all chimeras theorized and created hybrids of machine and organism i think none of us can say that we are all pure human beings we are pure humans how can we say we are pure humans we have a lot of chemicals in us and how do we have these chemicals i think uh, we are breathing chemicals we are uh, we are eating chemicals and even if you consider all these various forms of uh, fertility treatments a lot of artificial hormones are being pumped into the system and uh, you know something which is supposed to be happening naturally doesn't happen and all these different chemicals are pumped into the system so in fact your body is a house of all these artificial hormones so how can the human co- be called entirely natural but the same thing when it comes to trans people the kind of uh, when they undergo the operation and they try to you know uh, reassign their uh, reproductive organs and they try to reassign their gender they are seen as unnatural which is highly ironical so i think donna haraway who has proposed that we are all chimeras theorized and fabricated hybrids of uh, machine and organism and she says all of us are cyborgs uh she's a quite a quite an infant writer i think you should try and read donna haraway her writing is quite simplistic and uh very interesting too and uh another scholar bailey care claimed in 2013 that everybody on the planet is encompassed within the category of transgender so you just cannot talk about the trans people as transgenders but all of us are transgenders because he says uh he says that uh for the interdependence of humans and non humans and against the possibility of static identity so he says i mean all these scholars opine and uh, reinforce the fact that this cat and this naturalness and unnaturalness is something to be uh, it's is is it's something to be contested and how do you even say that uh, you are uh, you know you are uh, completely natural uh, human so the question of the unnatural trans body is highly questionable so i'd like to uh, quote uh, david heberstroff an american writer editor and teacher his debut novel titled the danish girl was adapted into an academy award winning film in 2015 so the story is inspired by the life of a trans person who is called uh, lily elbe and she is one of the first people probably in denmark to have undergone the gender reassignment surgery so connecting ecology and transgenders uh, he mentions evolution especially speaks to transgender themes the idea that a species must adapt in order to thrive 
the idea that there is no future without transformation a compelling example the idea that a creature that is a cat or a gazelle or a dragonfly knows innately what it is no one can tell the cat that he or she is a dragonfly the cat acts on instinct outside pressure bias or ignorance cannot undo the cat's understanding of who he or she is i believe knowing oneself innately is central to the experience of being transgender yeah quite a quite a pertinent observation here and uh, quite a bold thing to mention as well so now uh, now even if we look into our own context uh, i thought i would give you some examples here before winding up for the activity uh, if you take arundhati roy's the ministry of utmost happiness and there uh, that that text lends itself to studying uh, of trans ecology i mean the character anjum she lives in a graveyard and that graveyard is a place which is shunned by people and there uh, the place which is shunned by people uh, reflects her state also i mean so there you can make a connection between the place and uh, herself and uh, the the graveyard itself becomes an important character here because it is a dwelling place for many trans individuals as well as women squatters who do not uh, who do not find a place in the important sections of the society so how the graveyard as well and and the and the graveyard is also seen as a place which is uh, which does not uh, prescribe to the you know the, the binary dominant uh, systems of gender i mean it's a very it's it's a, it's a kind of a fluid space the space of the uh, graveyard so now uh, india if you see is uh, even though there are the studies uh, in in the areas of trans ecology is just about coming about but uh, there are many queer people who are avid poets bloggers writers who write their story through the metaphors of nature and ecology i think nature finds itself as a metaphor in many of these writers is uh, works and understanding their struggles and keeping the imagery of nature in their work is one way of understanding and looking at uh, the area of uh, trans ecology so since the area of uh, literary studies have become inclusive you know you have films you study policies social media and all these things come come under the ambit of uh, literary studies and uh, and uh, i mean you could apply the area of trans ecology to any of these texts to uh, you know to identify tropes and to identify features which could be uh, analyzed in through the lens of uh, trans ecology so with that i end my talk and